Yeah, good evening, friends. Uh, welcome to this Tuesday evening academic sessions from Yasoda Group of Hospitals. We bring uh, interesting and uh, debatable and interactive sessions of uh, current um, concern and current interest. So today uh, we have an interesting topic, which is uh, a burning issue of uh, the last couple of weeks. Uh, there are sudden surge in the cases of uh, fever and common cold, flu, and uh, some OPD increase in the both pediatrics and adult age group. So that created a lot of noise across uh, related to influenza being positive in few cases, and uh, both ICMR and other organization reporting there is a new variant of influenza, not the previous H1N1, which is causing the concerns that is H3N2, and the cases were rising. And off late, in the last couple of weeks or more, we have seen that the COVID positivity in many areas, including the 10, 15 districts in India, has gone beyond 14% as for the today's Times of India information. ICMR, Health Ministry, and different uh, government uh, areas are also been concerned about this. So there were a lot of queries across. How do we approach these cases? Do we need to test them? Do we need to treat them? How many of them getting sicker? So these are the many questions has been roaming around in the fraternity of medical science. So we felt to bring this area and of discussion to our academic forum. So we have Dr. Sri Charan, who will give us an overview of what is going on across India and globe in this fever cases and this influenza cases and also about the COVID positivity. And to have some expert opinion, we have none other than Dr. Harikishan, who has been interventional pulmonologist and an academician and of a great interest for this interactive sessions. So we have honor and a privilege to have you here, sir. Dr. Harikishan, sir, we welcome you to the session. Thank you, sir. Pleasure is mine. So, so, Charan, over to you to have a uh, quick overview, then we will come to that interactive session. So, good evening, everybody. I am Dr. Sri Charan, and I'm here to discuss uh, our experience on the new surge of flu and fever cases. And uh, I'm just going to go through the uh, epidemiological data of these fever flu cases, uh, being the influenza, COVID, H1N1, H3N2 cases in the Indian scenario, as well as in the present day world. So. Let us start with actually a case discussion, which we had recently. So this was a case of a 48 year old, completely two doses vaccinated, uh, COVID vaccinated farmer. He presented elsewhere with uh, severe uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome, and he was not actually amenable to, uh, like he was not responding well to the standard therapy. And he was also having significant severe uh, left ventricular dysfunction with ejection fraction of hardly 15 to 20%. And they, he was actually diagnosed as myocarditis. So he was in severe cardiogenic shock with high vasopressor support. He was in severe hypoxia with uh, PF ratios of not greater than 50. And in spite of maximal medical management in what can be done in a multi-speciality hospital, he was uh, not responding. And he was referred to Yashoda Hospital, Sekindrabad, because he was continuously deteriorating. And uh, it was thought that extracorporeal therapy at that particular point in time is the best way to go forward. So given his status of severe hypoxemia, along with the severe left ventricular dysfunction, it was decided that he, he requires both cardiopulmonary supports. So he was actually instituted, promptly instituted on a VA ECMO through the femoro-femoral route. So he was actually, after institution on a VA ECMO, he was actually shifted to, a, to the uh, ECMO, care, ECMO care unit. So he was actually under the multidisciplinary team of specialists where we have pulmonologists, Dr. Harikishan sir himself, critical care specialists, vascular surgeons, and cardiac anesthetists. So the initially his his left ventricular function was very bad. Where he, he there were significant STT changes, his top line top line I was elevated. He, there were global uh, STT changes in all, all over his ECG, which was actually signifying that there might be some uh, myocarditis. Because of severe left ventricular dysfunction, he was hardly having any ejections, and intermittently only he was actually ha having ejections. So after the institution of EECMO, his condition comparatively stabilized. So his uh, heart started to recover, his vasopressor and inotrope requirements slowly started to come down, his lactates were clearing, his organ functions were slowly improving. At that particular point in time itself, he was having acute kidney injury and uh, some degree of hepatopathy, which were both recovering. His AKI was non-oligoric and he was pouring good amount of urine. 
so uh, in in a span of 3 or 4 days we were actually following up with the uh, functionality of the myocardium with uh, serial 2d echograms and 2d echocardiographies were actually showing significantly improving uh, trend of uh, uh, left ventricular ejection fraction albeit not normal so then after his left ventricular ejection fraction was almost uh, greater than 30%, it was almost came up to 30 to 35%. And then we have repeated a CT scan to see uh, the improvement and the, uh, the it showed significant improvement in the CTs when compared to the previous CT with which he was admitted. So afterwards, in a week time, the patient gradually improved. He was decanulated of VA ECMO and he was even extubated of ventilator. So we as a team were all fortunate that we were able to save one more life for this patient. So this actually is one of the first cases of uh, severe. Then in the, we actually did a bronchoscopy for this patient and the bronchovalvular lavage was actually showing SARS uh, COVID-19 positivity. So we can say this is one of the very first cases of severe COVID-19 pneumonia with severe ARDS. And even though myocarditis, it's actually quite rare in COVID-19. We are actually reporting a case where there was severe ARDS along with myocarditis, which responded very well to VA ECMO support. Now, uh, it is actually being covered in the media also that there is a lot of uh, severe acute respiratory infection, SARI, or influenza-like illnesses, ILIs, which are present, which are being reported in the uh, in, in India today. So it, these were actually uh, snippets of various uh, news uh, outlets, which was actually showing that in Maharashtra there is an alert as there was an outbreak of H3N2. There was there was COVID outbreak, and uh, the government has to issue fresh, fresh guidelines. And there were also reports of where there was significant outbreak of history into outbreak which in India. So the, we were probably back to wearing masks is what the health, health ministry has advised previously. So in, even in Delhi, there was history into influenza outbreak which was reported. And there was also in parallel increase in COVID-19 cases recently. So what about today? So we, uh, when it really comes to actually, this was uh, taken from a news outlet in, uh, Times of India today. It was actually showing that India reported 699 new cases of coronavirus and two deaths in the last 24 hours. This was way more than what it was previously reported. So we have actually a rise in the number of coronavirus cases. And the it also showed that the number of districts in the country with, with greater than 10% positivity in COVID positivity has gone up to 14. So even in Delhi, there was a, a majority of the districts are also actually showing uh, COVID positivity in the ranges of 5 to 10%. So coming to co-infections, so how frequently are we actually looking at co-infections where we have both H3N2 as well as COVID-19 positivity? So it was actually reported the, that their co-infection might occur. I'll actually come to the details of the paper later. And uh, this co-infection, according to that paper, was actually showing significantly high mortality with either infection alone. So in India, it was only there was only one case of uh, H3N2 and COVID uh, co-infections. It was in the, one of the very first cases of H3N2 deaths in Maharashtra. And one of the deaths was a 23-year-old boy. And he was known to have COVID co-infection along with H3N2. So this is uh, the data from our hospital. So in the last three months, January, February, and March, we have actually seen that this particular pattern of increase in this RE and IFIs has increased from the last three months, among which in the initial stages, it was mostly H3N2. So we can actually see in January, our hospital in the, the, our unit had a increased cases of H3N2 with 28 positivities in January, 17 in February and 14 in March. So we also have influenza B positivities. Influenza B positivities was quite less, namely in January and February, three and six respectively, but influenza B positivity again shot up in March, it is 16. So COVID positivities, it was very less January one case, February two case positivities, whereas in March it has shot up to 18. So we are halfway through March and we also already have 18 COVID positive cases, our case being one of them. So, what does the ICMR data tell us? So ICMR data tells us that uh, this is actually uh, the ICMR data on influenza A COVID-19, influenza A uh, positivities, H1N1 pandemic O9 strain, and uh, we have influenza A H3N2 strain and influenza B Victoria strain. So among these influenza cases in India, we have actually seen that there is a consistent uh, like influenza A H1N1, that pandemic O9 strain is relatively constant with recent uh, from in from the first week of Jan until the, till the week uh, nine of 2023, we can actually see that it is hovering around in with an average of five, with a median of five. There are some times where it has shot up to eight, and other times where it even where it is even zero, but the median still remain five. Whereas H3 N2 cases, we can actually see that there is a consistently high positivity rates uh, of H3 N2 if you actually see the uh, pattern of involvement in uh, of H3 N2 in India. 
Influenza Victoria strains. Influenza B Victoria strains. Yes, we also have this Victoria positivity strains uh, in uh, uh, from the initial week one, and those are actually uh, going around with a median of eight to nine. So this is the uh, ICMR data on the Indian status of influenza pandemic or of the influenza cases positivity in India. Now coming to this is actually the uh, uh, robust data of, of the uh, of ICMR from week eight of two thousand twenty one to that of two thousand twenty three. So this is actually showing in the initial from the uh, if you actually see, look at the weeks initial weeks of 2023 uh, the initial H1N1 pandemics the H1N1 uh, data is like uh, the H1N1 cases are quite less whereas H3N2 counts is significantly higher. We have Victoria that is influenza B positivity in the uh, uh, in some numbers but COVID-19 numbers have been slowly increasing. The thing is but all from this data, if you actually compare to that of the, if you actually compare to that of the data from 2021 and 2022, 2022, obviously COVID has dominated it. Even during the time where COVID and influenza are uh, uh, higher, higher in high numbers during, especially during the week 30 to 30, week 30 to 40 of 2022, we can actually see that the most of these cases are H1N1 pandemic O9 strains and COVID-19 strains. It is H3N2 count per se is significantly low. Whereas, this time we are actually getting a lot of H3N2 strains with some COVID strains which are actually uh, developing over the last two weeks and some are H uh, influenza B strains whereas H uh, H1N1 influenza pandemic O9 strain is quite less. So this is actually from the World Health Organization data from off India. So how well, how what are, what are the various patterns of uh, influenza IFIs that influenza like ILS, influenza like illnesses and SARIs in India. Okay, so in here we can actually see that uh, as reported earlier, the influenza H1N1 strain is quite less. It's the light blue one, which is quite less compared to that the, the darker blue one, which is majority of the chunk is actually taken over by H3N2. Okay, this is the H3 strain and even greater than H1N1, we have these influenza B Victoria strain, which is coming up. So influenza B strain has got Yamagata strain and Victoria strain. It has actually postulated that post COVID uh, uh, pandemic, the Yamagata strain is, uh, we have probably, the Yamagata strain is, uh, it, it is not coming up recently because they were actually saying that it is, uh, uh, influenza B strains typically don't cause pandemics, they cause localized outbreaks. And it is because of these localized outbreaks and during those very strict COVID precautions of uh, uh, like respiratory precautions, probably Yamagata strain has gone extinct. But that is actually postulated. Now, I, I just wanted to uh, show a difference in the epidemiology of influenza strains in the Northern Hemisphere as well as the Southern Hemispheres. So in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, this is from the World Health Organization data. So in, in the uh, Northern Hemisphere, we can actually see that even with fifth March, overall, globally speaking, it is influenza A H1N1, which is dominating. Influenza H3N2 is there. It is actually comparatively slowly rising over the last uh, two weeks. But we can actually see that based on these bar graphs, it is the, the most dominant strain is H1N1 pandemic O9 strain. And there is some degree of H3N2, like influenza B strain. So most of the strain, influenza B strain is uh, not actually lineage, not determined whether it's a Victoria or a Yamagata strain. But when you actually see at the Southern Hemisphere, we can see a complete contrast where in Southern Hemisphere, influenza pandemics and the influenza outbreaks in the last uh, like eight weeks or nine weeks from in 2023, it shows typically a la large proportion of influenza B uh, with, with Victoria strain dominating it, as I previously said, and we hardly any see any Amagata strains at all. So it is influenza B Victoria strain, which is actually dominating the uh, outbreaks when it really comes to Southern Hemisphere. So this is one of the most uh, like uh, interesting epidemiological differences which we found when we actually looking through the WHO data for influenza. Whereas coming to COVID in the last three months, so there were, uh, so today's cases, like it was, these cases were actually taken uh, the day before yesterday, there were 336 cases on daily average with 145% uh, change in the 14 day uh, rate of positivity. But today's case is more than 600 cases in the daily average. So it is significantly higher. We can actually see that uh, in the last uh, one month or, or last two to three weeks, we can actually see there is consistent rise in the number of COVID-19 cases as we see. This is for India. So coming to uh, is how much is this SARS-CoV-2 that is COVID-19 as well as uh, influenza H3N2 virus co-infection 
co common. So it is actually found that this particular virus co-infection was actually occurring in Brazil last year during probably the uh, November, December seasons. So this is particularly showing that they have actually done an epidemiological service, surveillance of a northeastern Brazil. So they were, they were actually isolated in, isolated in an area and did an epidemiological surveillance of the northeastern Brazil. So there we actually found that it is co-infections are quite possible. And this paper particularly showed that there is a high, high, higher case fatality rate for uh, SARS-CoV-2 and influenza AH3 and 2 co-infections than observed for each of the infections uh, separately. So they actually called it as a twindemic and they just want, like, we don't have enough robust data of large numbers to actually say that it is significantly higher case fatality rate of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and influenza twindemic. But this is a pilot study which they have done in Brazil, which actually showed higher number of uh, case positivity, like higher number of mortalities in SARS-CoV-2. However, like there is a recent, uh, uh, you know, going on in the, which is coming up in the media saying that there might be uh, a strain of uh, HBB 1.16, which is a, a, a Omicron variant, which might be having a more uh, infectivity rate, though that is causing an increase in the, and that is causing an increase in the uh, number of cases of COVID positivities in India at present, but uh, till now, no case fatality has been reported yet. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Charan, for that overview. Uh, uh, we will move on to some interactive session. Uh, uh, Dr. Hari, uh, we do come across this kind of surges for the last uh, two or three years after the COVID pandemic. Everyone is worried and probably trending these numbers. So even in the early session of this year, January, December, we have seen some trending. I wanted to learn from you, uh, do, do this numbers also has been reflected in your OPD and IP practice also in the last uh, you know, month or so? What's your take on this? Yes, sir. Um, regarding uh, outpatient numbers, like uh, now there is a lot of news uh, saying uh, H3N2 being predominant, but if you look at the WHO paper, uh, uh, recently they have given us uh, one paper, which uh, in that uh, they have reported influenza B being more predominant in India. Um, I think uh, Charana, in that paper, it was B that is reported more, yes, I guess, yes. right? Yes. So, so in this recommendation, at some point they have mentioned which countries were uh, predominant with what type of strains. And uh, when we look at our data also, uh, I just made a small, you see my screen? Yes, yes. So total in the last two weeks, uh, we tested around 139 samples and of which uh, COVID was positive in 14, pa 14 patients. Um, and uh, if you see the number of samples uh, being tested for uh, uh, multiplex PCR biofire assays, both on uh, bronchoscopic BAL samples who are admitted with some other uh, problem and suspected to have some respiratory bacterial infections. But uh, surprisingly, in those patients also, because uh, predominantly we don't do a diagnostic uh, ball testing for uh, influenza and COVID, but in those samples, what we tested for multiplex PCR, a total sample number, if you can see here, 81 samples of which influenza A was 11, and uh, influenza B was seen in around uh, 14 patients. And uh, the next data also, if you see, number of uh, uh, patients uh, um, indirectly, the if you see the number of samples that are tested in the last uh, one month, day by day, if you see the number of uh, samples that are being tested for uh, viral screening, that number is uh, increasing from uh, around 10th of uh, this month uh, till this date. So we are around 26 samples, which we started doing around seven samples a day. So the OPD numbers are also increasing. This is not just uh, inpatient data. OPD numbers are also increasing, Of uh, which again, uh, this data is all presented by Charan also. Definitely there is a rise, but uh, people are only looking at influenza A and H3N2 as the predominant uh, variant. But the data is our data is also showing that there are a lot of uh, influenza B positive patients in our hospital uh, um, at, at this moment. So I think the trend what the WHO has shown in Bangladesh and other countries also uh, is the similar trend of influenza B also being a predominant strain in our place. So is that been reflected in the OPD uh, clinics and also IP uh, as a patients coming in with complaints or is that been in the only community trending 
the problem with uh, opd surveillance is that uh, we don't usually do um, multiplex pcr testing as a routine for all the opd patients because it's quite expensive, expensive. so the turnaround time is very fast so we are not testing them because if you see the symptomatology uh, compared to the previous h1n1 before covid or even the covid infections uh, when it when when we compare those to the first and second wave patients are not similar though the symptoms are a little more prolonged patients mainly are presenting with fever as the predominant complaint uh, uh, in this episode uh, a short uh, course of fever and then followed by a prolonged uh, cough uh, for more than seven days. That is what uh, we are noticing, which is a little uh, different pattern from the previous uh, influenza because usually more of rhinitis and all these things will start. Huh? So those symptoms we are not seeing in this current uh, trend of uh, patients. Uh, maybe some symptomatology also is a little varied from the previous strain. So the, you, you mean to say that there is definitely surge in the cases of respiratory illness and symptoms in the current weeks? Yes. Yes. And uh, how do you actually select? As you said, it's not uh, uh, feasible to actually investigate all these uh, OPD-based patients for uh, their mild and moderate symptoms. But how did you actually take your call to investigate which cases uh, uh, with a respiratory panel or... Uh, any of these multiplex like species. as we said uh, in this patient uh, what charan presented patient presented with uh, um, severe ards like picture on the ct scan uh, we were actually uh, about to extubate the patient from uh, ecmo on the day when we were trying to decanulate him from ecmo then uh, we thought because again after extubation it might be difficult to do a bronchoscopic uh, sampling because it, till that time we did not have any uh, diagnostic clue on the patient because it was more of heart failure and uh, myocarditis kind of picture. So uh, we did a bronchoscopy before the day of uh, decanulation. And surprisingly, we were also, I think Charan will agree, we are not expecting COVID to be the uh, cause of that uh, patient's illness because we have not seen. And also, if you see the illness patterns in influenza, what we have seen, most of the patients are... Uh, uh, either asthmatics or other previous uh, uh, respiratory illness patients, they are getting more affected. I mean, more asthma exacerbation uh, admissions are happening in the last uh, two to three weeks uh, than the normal uh, means immunologically um, sustained individuals. So the risk factors, if you ask me, is more of uh, a previous uh, chronic respiratory illness, those kind of patients coming to or uh, exacerbation or increase in their OPD visits. That's what we are seeing in our hospital at the moment. So how do you select your um, patients? So whom do you investigate them? Is the sickness or the comorbidities? The, the differentiation, like if you remember, sir, like uh, when we were also uh, facing the first wave of and second wave of COVID, we simultaneously did a study to see how many of these uh, COVID patients had influenza? The problem uh, of testing and uh, um, means making a decision whom to test. We are not testing most of the patients. If you ask me, 85-90% of the patients, we are not testing. True. But whenever there is a clinical uh, decision to be made, like uh, either change in uh, management, uh, because again, if you want to give some steroid uh, as a part of COVID treatment, most of the uh, ICU patients we are planning to test when they require a bronchoscopy or they go on a ventilatory support. But uh, asymptomatic or mild symptomatic patients who are coming to OPD, definitely we are not testing, but we are treating all the patients at this moment with uh, uh, flu flu wave. Uh, considering predominant strain is influenza, so we are treating them with flu wave. But uh, we are not testing co uh, COVID. I am definitely not testing in OPD, at least for this week. Maybe if the cases rise, then because we are seeing more COVID cases than influenza cases this week, uh, surprisingly. I think there, there is also an attempt made from your lab that uh, H3N2 and H1N1 been screened uh, simultaneously, which has a uh, maybe a package which is made to accommodate uh, this current surge in both the cases, both the case series. So there was a one one more point which you made. Ki what we have seen during the influenza pandemics or post-influenza pandemic also, the influenza pattern is more affected with those who had an underlying lung diseases, the active airway disease patient. 
which was not the same when we actually came across COVID. Uh, COVID was not making any big difference between uh, many of uh, those respiratory patients. We have, in fact, seen less of respiratory uh, cases in those pandemics. I don't know, maybe they were more careful or they were more isolated than others, but the case numbers were less. So do you find any difference in uh, current presentation? What are the vulnerable population? What are those cases which should be uh, more careful and which are the most common uh, comorbidities you are seeing coming with sicker or severe illnesses? I think all of you will agree before COVID, if you talk on influenza, most vulnerable population used to be pregnant females. A lot yes. of pregnant females yes. used to get admitted with severe ARDS. Yes. But in the last one month, being a tertiary care center where we treat also and also we test them uh, very early for all the viruses, uh, we have not seen much of a pregnant female getting affected this time. Uh, okay. So time we have to see uh, maybe in the next one month how things will change. As I told you before, most cases who have a pre, uh, prior respiratory chronic illness like asthma, COPD, they are, they are going to be the vulnerable population uh, with the current data what we have from our hospital admission, admissions. And uh, they are the people who are getting admitted in the intensive care units also. And also some patients uh, uh, where they are getting admitted as a case of respiratory infections, we are finding them to be having a connective tissue disorder. So testing, uh, because yesterday we had a female, 40-year-old female, uh, very short history, no uh, CTD features or anything, uh, landed up in the ICU, came walking to the hospital by the evening, she had a, a ICU admission and then ventilatory support. And uh, for some reason, uh, we tested a CTD profile also based on the radiological pattern, what she had looked like, some little alveolar hemorrhage kind of stuff. And then surprisingly, all the row 52, all these antigen came very uh, highly positive. So maybe there will be some set of patients also whom you should, uh, uh, because most of the times, if you see during COVID, we have missed a lot of patients uh, over, with overlap, connective tissue disease or with pulmonary manifestations presenting as respiratory failure. So we have to be keen on uh, making a, a clear differential diagnosis based on the radiological patterns. And uh, if you see the uh, pattern of uh, radiological involvement uh, with influenza and COVID, as you were asking, what, how are you differentiating and testing? Testing really for uh, COVID may not matter at this moment because we don't see any sick patients as such. Uh, hardly one or two patients we are seeing. But influenza, you know, it's a little aggressive disease than COVID. So testing for influenza might be of more help than doing for uh, screening uh, COVID patients because they're already vaccinated. And if you see the population also, uh, most of our people now are aware of uh, getting COVID vaccine, but uh, none of them, you know, I see in OPD, I ask them whether they have taken the flu shot, but none of them are actually taking these flu shots also. Okay. So that there is where questions. we need to educate. Yeah, we have questions related to your treatment modality. Um, Dr. Gajanan is a hospital guy. Dr. Gitesh is asking about uh, what, how is your treatment modality changing in your hospital right now? Uh, when you actually come across the IP patients, OP patient, is there any change in your approach? So now antivirals is the existing antiviral, which we call Dosiltama, we are still useful for the current variant of influenza, which you say is 3 and 2. So there are questions related to that. So treatment modality, as I told you, see, uh, whether I am testing all the patients, because, because it, it is very important at this moment to, to educate the peripheral centers also, because the moment we say COVID is uh, increasing in numbers, all the influenza mm -hmm. pa patients might receive corticosteroids as uh, we saw that uh, happening in COVID. So that is what uh, uh, the aim of our, I think the webinar should be like not to give steroids uh, in the early stage of especially H1N1 or H3N2 disease. So that we should be able to prevent. If you ask me treatment options, most of the patients we are treating with fluid. COVID, we are not uh, symptomatically treating with whatever symptoms they have, but no special treatment or any antivirals we are using at the moment, to be frank. And uh, empirically, uh, siltamavir will be your one of the drugs which you include in your, okay. Yes. And I think there is no harm uh, giving those drugs to uh, patients coming to the respiratory clinics with uh, respiratory symptoms. But as you know that in the in the current uh, state, we have influenza predominantly circulating. So, 
so and the early part maybe in the early and, part uh, is asking whether you do multiplex pcr in all suspected patients of uh, lrti actually it is good if we have that facility and the cost and the testing is uh, made very available to test all the patients because we also get data but since the test is very cost, that is the only limiting factor. Otherwise, I would love to do uh, as a OPD test for all the patients to see what uh, kind of, though it may not uh, have a major impact on treatment, but at least we know what uh, we are doing and what we are dealing with. So that is one thing. Now in the institution, if you ask us whom we are testing for multiplex PCR, all the tests what we have seen uh, in the presentation, what I made, they are not tested uh, just to identify a viral illness or what strain of influenza it is. They are done mostly for patients who uh, are either sick in the ICU or on mechanical ventilation where we thought uh, to rule out bacterial uh, pneumonias. So in that test, it also covers both viral as well as bacterial. So, that, uh, so we get the data retrospectively also in those patients and some insurance patients who have, because we need to show what... Uh, what, why, what is the need of admission for those patients also. Sometimes we uh, test these patients, but not routinely for all the patients. And maybe sometimes to de-escalate antimicrobials where you can isolate a particular bacteria or a virus in these situations, maybe you have selected that. Yes. So you, you are made clear that H3N2 as a variant of influenza A still have a uh, role to play with oseltamivir being an empirically covered. In the same way, you also made a comment about the influenza vaccinations, which has not been uh, a common practice in the last three or four years. And uh, there were also a lot of uh, uh, speculations that because we followed a lot of respiratory uh, isolations or ATKs or your uh, COVID appropriate behaviors, the circulation of influenza virus was uh, been uh, bottom low in the initial 20s and 21s. You have seen all COVIDs, but hardly very few influenza. I think you have also done a study to looking after a co-infections and all that. And as uh, uh, even Charan put out, the variant uh, uh, also, one of the variant is uh, considered to be uh, extinguished because of this uh, isolation precautions. But in the same time, you said about vaccines being useful. So we are seeing a little uh, virulent uh, influenza in the last year and vaccines has not been used appropriately or maybe not taken uh, in many of our uh, even vulnerable population. So there are questions related to the vaccines. What is your take and is the same vaccine will be useful for H3N2? So uh, as you were talking on the number of cases initially, first I'll answer this. Uh, if you see the WHO paper what came in February, uh, there is around, um, um, compared to 2021, 2020 to 2021, there is around 2.5 fold increase in the um, tests that are done for COVID and um, for influenza. And uh, there is a 35 fold increase in numbers. That's what they mentioned in that paper. And uh, strain wise, they have made uh, changes like they have seen which countries are having different strains. So if you talk on vaccination, Current recommendation, I think they are recommending uh, a trivalent vaccine uh, for 2022 and 2023. But currently what is available, what we have is uh, a quadrivalent vaccine uh, in our country. I think the change might uh, happen uh, now. But we are still giving the fluoric stator that covers the Victoria, Cambodia and uh, Washington and Phuket lineages in influenza A and B. So that is what we are uh, asking uh, our patients to take the vaccine for, uh, for influenza at this moment. So I, I, I think that uh, should be covering both your uh, uh, H1N1 and H3N2 at this point. Yes, of yes. Time. Because in, in the previous vaccine also, you, you have a Victorian lineage of 2019, that is H1N1. And then the Cambodia lineage is of H2N2. Both these influenza A are covered in that uh, previous vaccine, what we are using currently now. Any severity variations you have seen in during this last uh, uh, week or month? in the influenza pattern, H3N2 pattern or anything. You said symptomatology wise is a little different, but any severity wise, any changes you are seeing? Severity, if you ask, definitely uh, not so severe uh, before COVID influenza severity, we are not seen yet. Uh, maybe it, it is the beginning, we don't know. But those patients who became sick, uh, mainly they were also not uh, due to respiratory uh, consolidation or um, lung being predominantly affected. Most of these uh, 
uh, cardiac manifestations also we are seeing. So if you ask me severity at the moment, because we are not seeing these pregnant females or obese patients coming to the ICUs, no, we are not able because the, the indirect measure will be the number of ICU admissions that will determine the severity of the strain, no, but the number of ICU admissions come uh, with the influenza is definitely less. And also those patients uh, who usually are sick during influenza, we are not seeing them also in the ICUs. And the number of ECMO patients we have is also hardly one or two patients now. So I, I think uh, not, not nothing to panic or uh, we don't have to worry too much about the, uh, because this is the transition period and the you know, summer is also coming quickly. So no, um, no strain at this point of time on healthcare systems as of now? Definitely. Uh, what is your uh, experience there? It's uh, the same. I think uh, we have not seen many uh, IP patients or ICU patients yet. We are seeing on and off pockets of cases coming in and many of them had underlying respiratory illness uh, like they are either having a COPD or a asthmatic who got exacerbated during this illness and they found to have positive and maybe here and there patchy consolidations uh, not typically like what we have seen uh, with that. Uh, and uh, another point, point, see, few of the cases in COVID where we have seen the resolution is with a fibrotic phenomenon. Is that been seen the same way in influenza, any of the cases? We, you have been also put patients on ECMO, also patients been ventilated in the last uh, uh, maybe two years. In the 2022 also, you have seen good number of influenza cases which been uh, on severe RDS. Uh, we lost a few cases. We could extubate many cases. What is your uh, uh, trend you see in that? Is there going to be same kind of uh, fibrotic changes what we have seen at uh, tough cases like during the COVID? Means, uh, it's quite different when you ask about uh, COVID and lung fibrosis. Uh, surprisingly, uh, most of the patients who had severe ARDS and whom we thought that most of these patients will have permanent uh, fibrotic lung, most of them uh, recovered without any uh, further management. But uh, influenza, only extrapolation of data from the previous subsets, but uh, currently we don't have that kind of uh, sick patients. So if you see the previous influenza, influenza-related lung fibrosis was never behaving like a uh, COVID uh, lung fibrosis. So we never gave antifibrotic medications. Maybe the numbers were high in COVID, so everybody started using whatever best they can do for their patients. But uh, influenza uh, has a subset of patients which will develop lung fibrosis. But in this uh, season, that's what we, we are really uh, discussing on. That kind of severity we are not experiencing uh, at the moment. So we are uh, not expecting patients will have lung fibrosis and uh, long symptoms related to influenza. Charan, you have also been uh, showing some images of HBB 1.16, uh, which has been a new variant of COVID, which has been found in the last uh, maybe December, January onwards. And there is a rise in cases uh, across India when they have been testing, including today's Times of India talks about there are around 10 districts where the positivity rate has gone beyond 14%. That means every 100 patients they are testing, 14 cases are coming positive. So what is your take on that? Uh, you have reviewed those uh, uh, news uh, articles. What is your take on that? So, sir, actually they have reported uh, that there could be this uh, the, a, a new Omicron variant, namely this HBB 1.16 is uh, probably responsible for the spike in the number of cases of COVID in the last three months. It was first isolated in January. Uh, so it, at present, they are showing is the highest number of cases in India, like in the world with this variant is in India, so followed by the United States. But the number of cases they actually reported with this variant is around 55 to 58, which itself as an absolute number is quite less. And we still have no robust data from the ICMR or the World Health Organization saying that this is the predominant strain, which is causing the number of uh, increase in the number of cases in the last uh, three months. And uh, based on the same data alone, we can say that this there, there has been no case fatality which has been reported by this particular variant. So the the previous variant 1.5 XBB 1.15 or 1.5 was actually uh, predominant during the 2022 uh, winter seasons. So it is also actually does not have any higher mortality rate. So this if with this particular variant in the last three months since its uh, isolation in the last three months, it has there there has been no case fatality yet. Any comments? Uh, on that? I think uh, since being a variant of Omicron, because the same kind of news was circulated uh, even one 
three four months the back group. when there was a new variant so i think we should not stress more on that and make panic uh, with that covid the variant of omicron so omicron variant uh, used to be the milder form so whatever may mutations come whatever infectivity come it may not put any strain on at least healthcare systems at this point of time that's what you mean to say yes so i just wanted to actually take a final comments uh, dr hari what what is your see we have seen a rise in cases there is a noise across there is a h3n2 being positive uh, every day newspaper uh, there is an article of this and even in the real time we are seeing families being sick school children is being affected and a sicker group may be getting more affected so do you actually wanted to give a guide to the at least the vulnerable population so we all being now out there is no uh, uh, covid appropriate behavior respiratory etiquette and all is it a time at least a, a, a subset of population should be uh, given a warning sign at this time uh before giving my comment i just want to ask you what is your experience on the pediatric group because in uh, we are not seeing that many pediatric uh, patients also because since the schools are uh, functioning we are not seeing uh, many uh, people with respiratory it was there uh, one two months back with the previous influenza what we had but this time we had less uh, uh, pediatric patients coming to respiratory adult clinics uh, usually we will have a small overlap of pediatric patients as well but we are not noticing that and uh, my uh, take home will be like uh, i think we should all get vaccinated for influenza first okay. second vulnerable population in this uh, season are more of patients who have a chronic underlying respiratory disease like asthma and copd who are actually smoking above 50 60 years of age group these are the patients uh, who in seem to be a uh, little more at risk and uh, pregnancy though we are not uh, seeing uh, cases but still remain to be always a risk factor because there's a lot of challenge in ventilating those patients and all so they also should get uh, vaccinated as early as possible and uh, coming to screening we don't have to test all the patients um, means if you are uh, because influenza if you see you have to treat early before uh, because if you send those uh, tests again the conventional test may take 3 uh, 4 days by the time uh, either the disease progresses or the disease will regress so starting those patients who come to your opd clinic stable patients i think there is no harm treating them with uh, uh, oseltamivir at this uh, moment and uh, covid in the periphery uh, not to put them on steroids uh, early because without a differential diagnosis being made between influenza and covid sometimes can harm the patients also that is one point we should be uh, communicating to our colleagues who are watching this and uh, early ecmo initiation for those patients who come to the uh, emergency rooms that is one thing we should be uh, telling to our er colleagues also like uh, to identify those subset of patients who are fit for uh, uh, because uh, that is where we can prevent lot of uh, mortality if you see the case what was presented today by the time uh, he came to the casualty he was on uh, duola inotropic support uh, with a ph of around 7 so at the decision time uh, to decide to take the patient on va ecmo was also quickly made i think that is the reason why the patient was saved so those decision making uh, discussions and all are very important uh, especially in this season so reversible refractory cases who are not responding to the standard therapy and are suitable patient for the ecmo early decision early initiation will save more lives than if it has been taken in the later part of the disease after prolonging the illness in a ventilated situation when they are not responding i think you made a very uh, uh, clear statements about this vaccinate as many as possible at this point of time more importantly influenza vaccine if you have not vac taken your shot that's what you made and maybe right now we are seeing a surge so adding your oseltamivir as a uh, empiric therapy for those who are actually coming with a acute respiratory illness to you you want those who actually had a underlying lung conditions what about the immunocompromised host do you also give the same kind of statement to them they need to be more careful um maybe yes but uh, our experience on those patients we are not seeing those uh, transplant patients coming with uh, viral illness at this moment uh, maybe you know, maybe another two weeks we will have more data but i think they also fall under a general risk factor group so we should also uh, include them as a uh, priority patients and uh, selecting the patients who are sicker group 
to actually identify and uh, probably de-escalate, escalate, optimize the antimicrobial therapy, and probably giving a prognostication. You you said multiplex PCR can be a therapy in them, and many of the uh, IPMs which may take a day or two. So until that time, empirically continuation of your oseltamivir. Uh, and the dose you still recommend the 75 milligrams twice a day is enough or do you still sometimes there was a controversy between the dosing between two uh, big guiding groups what what is your take on the dosing we i think now we are using only 75 bd uh, dosing uh, but and again you made a very big statement no corticosteroids at this point of time we have seen enough of destruction and no COVID cases, no much lung fibrosis, no much sicker ARDS. So corticosteroids at this point of time should be avoided as much as possible. No, no I, I think why it, I, I said that is like if you have a patient, young patient who is becoming sick, like if he is admitted somewhere in a peripheral hospital, uh, three to four days a patient goes on a ventilator. And then because I have seen one patient during the previous overlap between COVID and influenza, we lost him by the time he came here. He was given a pulse uh, corticosteroid therapy, but uh, he was finally found to have uh, influenza uh, positivity. So that patient was uh, admitted here with organ failure and a uh, lot of discussion happened regarding transplant and all. But uh, by the time he came here, he received these uh, pulse corticosteroids and all. We were really uh, 27, 28 old patients. So I think that is uh, because with some previous experience of uh, COVID, some doctors might also consider giving them this. That is the major uh, treatment uh, difference because if you talk on influenza, there is nothing much to treat in a uh, asymptomatic patient, right? It's just giving them antiviral medications. But those patients whom we can save is those subset who can have an ERDS like picture. So you say at this point of time, there is nothing to actually worry about or alarming, but you need to be watchful, careful, keep monitoring the patient and see the trend. Uh, nothing to panic at this moment of time with this. This is again, like looks like a surge of influenza with more of mild to moderate cases with more of OPD based uh, clinic uh, based treatment, no much sick ICU patient, no much strain on healthcare system. Uh, is that your final uh, takes to point? So thank you, Dr. Hari in uh, uh, being a part of this academic session and sharing your knowledge, experience and wisdom. And thank you, uh, Dr. Sri Charan, in bringing those updates. Uh, so thank you all participants being there with us. Uh, so we uh, keep on updating and bringing uh, this kind of topics. And uh, thanks for joining us. I conclude the session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Charan, for being with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you.